Bringing glory to God is the goal of every believer. We don't do this in a moment in time or through some achievement, but through a journey. At Cornerstone, we want to help people take that journey. A motto that guides us as followers of Christ is that we live for more. But not more according to the world's standards, not more stuff, more money, more popularity, more security, or more control. We live for more according to God's standards. More at Cornerstone means making disciples, obeying God's word, reaching the lost, and exalting Christ. Making disciples is the mission of God's people. God's kingdom grows as we grow spiritually. Obeying God's word is how we live for God's approval, not man's. Therefore, we obey his word as a demonstration of our faith that God knows best. Reaching the lost is our mission to carry the message of hope to people who need a savior. We are Christ's ambassadors, reconciling people to God with the message of the gospel. Exalting Christ occurs when the pursuit of Christ becomes your primary passion. When this happens, you will exalt him in every area of your life. Jesus called this the greatest commandment, to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. When a church gets this right, everything else falls into its proper place. We then understand a church is not a building, it is a group of believers standing together, united in the same mind and spirit, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Join us here at Cornerstone. Be a part of something that's bigger than yourself. Come live for more. Well, welcome. If you are new here to Cornerstone, we are going through this crazy series on the tabernacle in the Old Testament. And as we've taught through this, uh, we, we have reconstructed piece by piece the furniture and even the tabernacle itself, and uh, we're really excited. We're going to have a, uh, a walkthrough event uh, where people will get to come and experience uh, the tabernacle as it was designed um, by uh, the Lord so many, about 3,500 years ago. Uh, there may be a few tickets left. You can go back and check at the Welcome Center. It was a crazy thing this week. We opened up uh, some more tickets, 100 more tickets, because uh, so, so many of you guys filled it up last Sunday. So we opened up 100 tickets, and we filled those 100 tickets in one day. It all happened in the same day. Uh, so this is going to be uh, well attended, and, and I'm so excited about that because uh, out of about 500 people signed up for this right now, it's only about half of us. Uh, so this has given us a great opportunity to minister to those in the community. And, uh, and, and I, I'm telling you, the tabernacle is such a powerful illustration of how sinful people approach a holy God. And, and it's a, a wonderful uh, 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 tool that points forward to Christ. So I'm just really looking forward uh, to showing our community what this is all about and, uh, and, and as we're singing today, we, we really want to make much of Jesus, and this is some of the ways that we can do that. So if you haven't signed up for that yet, I do encourage you to do that. Uh, boy, make sure you do that today. And at this point, I'm not sure that we can guarantee that everybody coming in will, uh, will get one, but we will do our very, very best. We don't want to send anyone away. We want you to experience this. A lot of people working very hard on this. Uh, so today, uh, we're gonna, we've worked our way all the way up to the altar of incense, the golden altar. So if you haven't been tracking with this series from the beginning, let me just do a real quick run through. Uh, we've had uh, lots of different things that we've experienced as we go, in, uh, go into the tabernacle courts and approach God's presence. Uh, the very first thing was coming into the, the gates of the tabernacle, and this was an illustration that there was only one way to God. In fact, We'll talk, as we talk about the priests and the Levites today, uh, you're going to see that it was, it was very, very guarded, the tabernacle of God. You could only get in one way, and that was through the east gate. And people, it says in Psalm 100, uh, that people would come in with praise and thanksgiving. This was a wonderful time for them because they understood that their God was dwelling in their midst and was inviting them to approach them. And yet God needed to communicate to them that it is no small thing for a holy God to dwell in the midst of a sinful people. If it wasn't for the, the tabernacle and the protections put in place, the barriers between he and the people, he told Moses, I would go into the camp and consume them. So it's a great teaching tool for us as well because we can become cavalier in our approach to God. We can forget just how holy and awesome and powerful he is. I mean, we're given reminders all through the Bible as we see prophets and apostles get a glimpse of Jesus every time they're on the ground, on their faces, terrified. 
His power is something to be reckoned with, and yet he draws close to us. Uh, So this is just a marvelous thing to think about. So as people came through those front uh, gates, the east gates to the tabernacle, the very first thing they would encounter uh, is, is an altar, this bronze altar of sacrifice sometimes called the great altar. And we had that up here at one point. Uh, It it was just this great big altar where people would sacrifice uh, lots of different kinds of sacrifices, peace offerings and sin offerings, guilt offerings, trespass offerings, all kinds of different things, burn offerings. And uh, we've explained what some of those are, but basically these are different ways where people would offer gifts to God, uh, oftentimes addressing sin and uh, and the book of Hebrews very clearly teaches us that without, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So there were illustrations pointing ahead to what had to eventually happen. Uh, the ultimate sacrifice, of course, was through Jesus Christ, who shed his blood once uh, for, for all of sin, all the sins of men to be covered. But until that happened, uh, the people of Israel, God's people, were offering sacrifices on a daily basis. A lot of sacrifices going on outside of that tabernacle, but inside the courts. Then after the sacrifice, the priest would go to what was called a laver or a basin, and in there was water for him to cleanse his hands and his feet. This was necessary before going into the actual tabernacle and ministering before the Lord. God made it very, very clear, priests, you have to cleanse yourselves before coming into my presence. In fact, a a priest would die immediately. Uh, if he were to go into the tabernacle without having cleansed his hands and feet. Uh, and, and that pointed to uh, the, the, the Word of God, the Word of Christ here in the New Testament. Uh, he, he talks about cleansing us with the washing of the water of His Word in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. So then as the priest would come into the actual tabernacle itself, there would be various pieces of furniture in there. Uh, to, uh, as, a, as, as you walked in there to the right uh, would be the table of showbread, which we talked about last time, which is the table of the the presence of God. It had these 12 loaves, and it was basically a word picture, a demonstration, more than a word picture, uh, that these 12 loaves represented the 12 tribes of Israel, and God was inviting them into his presence. Uh, And and beyond that, he was reminding them that he was their provider. Across from that was uh, the lampstand, which was a 75-pound solid piece of gold that uh, you poured oil into, and it it illuminated. It was the only source of illumination inside that tabernacle. And uh, it allowed the priests to do their works, and they had to always keep that burning because it symbolized the very presence of God. And the oil was a picture of the Spirit of God. Uh, And there's some interesting things that the prophets had to say about that Spirit of God. And it even goes all the way to Revelation, talking about the sevenfold Spirit of God with the seven prongs of that uh, lampstand. In fact, Hebrews reminds us that this, this, uh, this design that came down in the midst of the camp actually was a reflection or a pattern of a heavenly reality. Uh, some of these things are actually going on in heaven way back then and still now. We're, we'll even learn about that today. So the third piece of furniture inside the tabernacle was the altar of incense, the golden altar of incense. And that's what we have up here. And uh, we have our high priest uh, standing next to that who would tend this thing. And uh, we're going to read out of Exodus chapter 30 this morning and get a description of what all was going on and taking place here, how this was formed. Uh, it's, it's a really neat thing here. And it was one of the highest functions of the priest to tend this particular altar of incense. If you have your worship folders with you this morning, our first fill in the blank uh, is prayer. When approached through the model of the tabernacle, is a sweet aroma to the Lord. We're going to talk about prayer this morning. That's what would take place at this altar. But the tabernacle itself is an illustration of how we pray. We come into the presence of God with joy and thanksgiving. We talk about sacrifice and look to Christ to forgive us of our sins. We talk about the cleansing that can be given to us through the, the Word of God and, and coming into His presence and, and being, having our eyes illuminated by the Holy Spirit. This is all a great model for prayer. Uh, but there's more to it than just how we pray, but why we pray. In what spirit that we're doing this. And that's, that's what this one, this altar, was all about. So let me read to you Exodus chapter 30, verses 1 through 10. Follow along in your Bibles if you brought them. And it says, You shall make an altar on which to burn incense. 
You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length, and a cubit its breadth. It shall be square, and two cubits shall be its height. It's very similar to what you see up here. Its horn shall be of one piece with it. And, and these horns were a picture of authority and power. And the priest, as he would pray over the people, would actually grip a hold of these horns and pray and wrestle with God. Very, very dramatic picture of how the priest would pray over the people of Israel. Verse 3, you shall overlay it with pure gold. In fact, this was often referred to as the golden altar, and the one outside that was made of bronze would be referred to as the great altar because of its size. That's often how they would distinguish uh, those two altars. So you overlaid this one with gold, its top and around its sides and its horns, and you shall make a molding of gold go around it. And you shall make two golden rings for it. Under its molding, on two opposite sides of it, you shall make them, and they shall be holders for the poles with which to carry it. And you can see the poles uh, going across in front there. Uh, the priest would carry it that way. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, and you shall put it in front of the veil that is above the Ark of the Testimony. So this was in the center of the holy place, right in front of the veil. And we'll, we'll talk through the veil here in a couple of weeks. So they're putting it in front of the veil above the Ark of the Testimony, in front of the mercy seat that is above the testimony where I will meet with you. We'll talk about the Ark of the Covenant next week, and that's literally the throne of God in the midst of his people in the most holy place, going beyond the veil, very, very special place. Uh, verse 7, And Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. Very interesting. God was very peculiar on how the incense was burned on this. And uh, in just a, a few moments here, I'm actually, we have a, a guesstimate. Uh, we can't pinpoint exactly uh, all the ingredients that were used, but our, our closest approximation, God gave the literal ingredients to be used by the priests. And, and we've got some of that up here, and I'm going to put that on this, uh, this sensor. And uh, it's a very pungent smell. And I'll kind of walk around through you a little bit. You'll get to experience that smell, that, uh, th this incense that would be burned by God's design. Every morning and at twilight, the high priest would burn it on a regular basis, that incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Again, a picture of the prayers of the priest, the high priest going up before God. And God says, when, as these prayers, as you've gone through the joy of approaching him and the sacrifice needed to atone for your sins, the cleansing, uh, the, the uh, communion with him and the fellowship, the illumination uh, by the time you've gone through all that and then you stand before God and you begin to pray on behalf of his people, that was a beautiful smell to him. That was someone praying in the right heart and spirit before the Lord. Verse 9, you shall not offer unauthorized incense on it or burn an offering or a grain offering and you shall not pour a drink offering on it. Not that kind of altar. Not doing sacrifices on this one. This is for fragrance. Uh, so God is very particular. He wants it done in the direct way that he talks about it. He wants the exact incense used. He wants it done and carried out the way that he said it. And, and no, no sacrifices on this one. Don't, don't offer. This is not the great altar. Don't treat it that way. It's, it, this is different. Verse 10, Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once a year. That was on the day of atonement. So when he would go in before the mercy seat and and they would, they would sacrifice the bull on that one time a year. He would take the blood and, and he would place that on the horns of this altar. Very special day. In fact, the Day of Atonement was the only day that Israel fasted as a nation. Typically, their holidays were festive and joyful. The Day of Atonement was the only day the nation was called to fast. So he shall make atonement for it in the year throughout your generations it is most holy to the Lord. I want to pause right there. This, this station is most holy to the Lord. The way this is carried out, God is telling uh, and instructing Moses to instruct the priests and the Levites, this is a big deal to me. What takes place at this altar is holy unto the Lord. So we want to understand this. Isaiah 56, 7 is a verse that we have plastered over here uh, on our wall. It says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. See, God instilled very, very early in the formation of His people that prayer meant a lot to Him. Not only how it was done, but in the spirit that it was done, it is something that is holy to Him. 
in your worship folders, let's start to talk about these priests. The, the priests were set apart uh, for service to God and protected his holiness and honor. You did not approach God in a cavalier manner. You didn't just do things the way that you felt like they should be done. You did them according to God's direction. You honored him. As a priest, it was so important that you not only served the high king, but you did it in a way that glorified him and exalted him. All right, And that begins in the heart, not just in the servants itself. So, let me get this uh, incense out. And I'm going to let you guys have a little bit of a smell of what this stuff smells like. So I've got the, the resin here in this little spoon. There's a burning coal in here. I'm going to pour that on here. You'll see some smoke begin to rise. That fragrance would go up before the Lord. And this is a censer. You would put this on here so that the priest wouldn't burn his hands when walking around with this. Now, interestingly enough, as I, as I pass by, you, you'll smell that this is a, a potent little smell. Yeah. As, as, as I do this, the layout of the tabernacle, as the priests would do their, their ministry here, uh, this tabernacle was highly protected. Uh, so it was in the very center of the camp. You see that, kids? Let me know if you can smell that a little bit. Yeah, don't touch. Just smell. Can you guys smell that a little bit? Yeah, that's gross, they say. Okay. <laughs> They're loving it. I can just tell. So over here to the north side of the tabernacle, we would actually have three tribes that were protecting this edge of the tabernacle. It was Naph Naphtali, Asher, and Dan. And out of those three, Dan was the tribal leader. All right, So they were the leader of those particular tribes. Uh, down to the south, the opposite end of our sanctuary over there where those verses are uh, written on the wall, uh, we had Reuben and Simeon and Gad. And Reuben, uh, Reuben was the tribal leader on that side, and they would protect the tabernacle from outside armies on that direction. Up on the stage where the priest is, that was to the west. We had Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh. And it was actually... Uh, Ephraim was the tribal leader, and interestingly enough, it should have been Manasseh. But you remember when Joseph brought his, uh, uh, his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, before Jacob, and Jacob swapped his hands, and he messed with the birth order? That's why Ephraim ended up being the tribal leader instead of Manasseh. It was supposed to be Manasseh. Okay, are you guys smelling this at all? Am I leaving a trail? Yes, oh, yeah. The, uh, the adults are joining the children's choruses over on that side. And then, of course, on the eastern side, the eastern gate, uh, that's, that's where we had Issachar and Judah and Zebulun. You guys might know who the, the tribal leader of those three are. Any guesses? It was Judah. And Judah had a very, very important role in the lineage of Israel. So they would protect, the entire camp would protect uh, the, the, the tabernacle. But then some people were asking me, what about the tabernacle itself? What, what's to stop someone uh, from, from trying to get into the tabernacle from another direction? Well, you'll notice out of all of those different uh, tribes that I just mentioned, I left one out. Did you catch which one is missing? Levi. Yeah, you. You said that out loud. That is the kids. Yeah, the tribe of Levi, I did not mention... Because Levi was broken apart and, and surrounded the tabernacle even between these different tribes and the tabernacle itself. Put this up here. So now, like it or not, you got a whiff of some of the styles and scent smells of, of incense uh, that would be burning inside this tabernacle. To fill a room this big, that's pretty powerful stuff. So let me describe how the tribe of Levi, even beyond 
how the tabernacle was already being protected, they protected it a step further. So they were broken into parts, uh, little factions, and, and they would stay around, uh, around these sides as well. So uh, to, to the north, uh, where, where Dan was the tribal leader, you had what was called the Merorites. They were a faction of the Levites, and they were between those tribes and the tabernacle court itself. And you would not get through the Merorites. The Merorites were responsible when the tabernacle would move. They would take the hard structures, the pillars and the rings and, and the things that held up the tabernacle. That was their responsibility. They would move that part of the tabernacle. And then when it was time to set camp again, they would get it all set back up. They were hard workers. They were also warriors. They would be called to battle whenever, there was, whenever Israel went to, to war. So I want you to understand these Merorites were a faction of Levi that would literally protect by the sword the, the tabernacle. No one was getting in on the northern side of the tabernacle. And then we could go down to the, to the southern side, and we had the Kohathites. And the Kohathites were a second faction of the Levites. And they did the same thing. They were warriors. They would go to battle if called upon. They were trained with the sword. But the Kohathites... Uh, they, were, they, were, uh, they were on the same side where uh, Reuben was the tribal leader. It would be they, they would come in first if they were going to move the camp, and they would cover all the holy items inside the tabernacle. No one was allowed to see them. No one was allowed to touch them. In fact, even though something like this altar would be carried by the posts, it would be covered itself. It was not to be looked upon or touched. So the Kohathites would go in, and they would cover all that furniture, and they would be the ones carrying the furniture in, the, in the, the procession as they moved along, and even things like the bronze laver in the, the, the great altar, they would take that down and they would carry that. Uh, so they were, they were over the furniture, moving that. Then finally to the, the east, um, we, we had another group of Levites, the Gershonites. Same thing, trained by the sword, would go to battle. They protected the back side of the tabernacle, and they would come in and actually they would take all the coverings. And after we've been trying to actually mess with all the coverings for our model in here, I can tell you that was a big job. They had all these pieces of coverings that would cover the tabernacle. And they loaded those up and tore those down and got them rehung again uh, as they would move camp. So now that, that covers the, the north side and the south side and the west side. And now we have over where Judah is the tribal leader, the very front, the eastern gates. And this is where Aaron himself and Moses would camp out and the priests. And the priests were selected from the tribe of Levi. Just because you were a Levite doesn't make you a priest. But if you were a priest, you were definitely from the tribe of Levi. They were there to minister at the entrance. Now, the front entrance wasn't guarded because people were welcome to come in. They wanted that. And that's where their leaders were, and that's where, uh, that, that's where people were welcomed into the tabernacle. That's where the priests would come in and out. It made sense for them to be there as they ministered at the tabernacle. So this tabernacle, no one was sneaking in there or crawling under or anything like this. The Levites took responsibility to guard this thing, even inside the camp of Israel, which guarded it against any outside Threat, a very well guarded place. Uh, so let me start to talk then, since we've talked about the Levites, we've talked about priests, let me talk about the high priest, Aaron. Uh, we don't have time this morning, but if you were to follow to the letter uh, the garments that he wore, we've done our very best uh, to, to replicate what that might have looked like, and there's a lot of uh, significance to this. Uh, so he wore a uh, he, he wore this tunic here, or uh, his hat here, and, and on, so, uh, on top of it, he had this golden plate that said, Holy unto the Lord. This, this was a very, very important uh, piece of wardrobe that he had here, and he was marked, set apart to the Lord. If he were to sin, he has to sacrifice a bull before he can go before the Lord again. Uh, out here, he has some precious jones, stones here and gems. Uh, this, this is some onyx stones. It has the uh, the name six of the tribes of Israel, and on the other side, the other six tribes of Israel. He is here to minister to the, tribe, to the tribes of Israel. Uh, the same thing on this breastplate. Uh, we have 
I'm going to set this down real quick. We have 12 gems, and on each gem is the actual name of a tribe. And interestingly enough, it was part of the high priest's job to seek the Lord for direction. And, and sometimes they would, they would use what's called Urim and Thummim. Inside this breastplate, they would keep a little pouch. Let me see if I can find it in there. Here it is. We don't know exactly how this was used, but inside they kept a couple of gems. We believe one was black and one was white. And the, the best guess that we have is when they needed direction on something, they would simply reach into the bag and, and they, would, they would inquire of the Lord and black meant yes, white meant no. Uh, they still use that a little bit later on down in their history, but enough, there's not enough specific instruction given in the Bible uh, and there's not enough left of tradition for us to know exactly how that was used. And we don't recommend that for following the Lord's will for your life today. Uh, don't use the Urim and Thummim approach. We have the entire word of God that we use uh, for that. So then beyond that, we have this, this ephod, and this ephod is, a, is something that set the high priest apart. No one else had anything like that, a very beautiful garment. Uh, he had a, a belt that would, that would pull all this together, a blue robe underneath that. And you'll notice here, strangely enough, the Bible says that at the bottom of that blue robe was bells and pomegranates. All right? Uh, so that's what we've got here. We've got some bells and pomegranates. And as the high priest would, would minister, especially back in the Holy of Holies, they would listen for this sound just to make sure that the high priest was still alive because one wrong move in the very presence of God with such raw power of God where a, a, a mere man, a mere mortal was, was ministering there, a very high likelihood he could perish. And those bells would let them know that, yes, the, the priest is still in there, still alive. And tradition says that when he would go in there on the Day of Atonement, they would even tie a rope to his, uh, to his foot in case the bells stopped making any noises. They could get him out of there. Uh, that's, that's what tradition says anyway. Uh, and then, then he just had a, a, a normal robe on under that. And to the, to the best of our ability, this is, this is something about what that would have looked like, their high priest ministering. And he would have spent a lot of time right here at this altar. Part of, part of his job was to pray, not just to uh, go through those motions of serving the people, but to pray for the people. Uh, very interesting. I, I want to bring a little piece of the New Testament alive to you while we're doing this. This, this uh, altar of incense was actually where Zechariah uh, was praying when, when, uh, right before Jesus was born in John the Baptist. I'm going to go to Luke chapter 1. So maybe this will help you understand. Luke chapter 1, you often read this for a Christmas story. But listen to some of these details. I'm going to start in verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So just, just listen to this story a little bit. You guys know the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Many of you have heard this during Christmas time. Listen to them. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly. As we've walked through this tabernacle, we understand that it is important that people who have a close relationship with God are walking blamelessly. Not that they're perfect. Uh, to be righteous means that we are taking advantage. When we fall, we come into the presence of God and receive His cleansing. But we're not sinning flippantly and not thinking much of it. We're, we're repenting when that happens and, and continuing to draw close to God. So verse 7 says that they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, so obviously he's a Levite. According to the custom of the priesthood, he is a priest, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Well, now we know where Zechariah is, don't we? He's ministering unto the Lord right here at the golden altar. Verse 11, there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. It would have been very similar to what you see up here for the placement of the high priest. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. I'll bet he was. And fear fell upon him. This was not normal. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. 
Zechariah was praying here at the altar, the golden altar. That was its function. And God heard this righteous man's prayer and sent an angel to speak to him. And he said, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. By the way, what an awesome prayer, moms and dads who are expecting uh, that God's hand would be on your child even from the womb. In verse 16, he says, He will turn many children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. I, I tell you this story because I just want that New Testament story to come alive to you a little bit. This would, of course, have been at the temple at that time. But look how God can act and move in the prayers of a righteous man. James chapter 5 has a lot to say about this, and the original tabernacle design shows why it is a righteous man's prayer, a righteous woman's prayer that moves the heart of God. Not people that just casually walk into the presence of God, uh, not taking time to think through the sacrifice and the cleansing and drawing near to Him in fellowship, seeking His face before His hands, letting the Spirit illuminate their eyes. Once we've gone through these steps and taken the time to approach a king the way that he should be approached with honor and dignity and reverence, then we have His attention. Now, again, you, we can always throw a Hail Mary out there. God, I just need to speak to you and now. You know, kind of like the Nehemiah prayer, God, help me. But on our day-to-day -day approach to God, we ought to think through how we're doing that. God heard this righteous man's prayer, and he gave the gift of a child, though they were barren. It says in verse 6 that they were both righteous before God and walking blamelessly. Wouldn't that be a tremendous testimony of our church family? Wouldn't it be awesome if God looked down at this church and he said, these are a people that are righteous and walk blamelessly. You know, I think the heart of God longs for that in his church today. Remember, it is the duty of a priest. By the way, we're all called priests in the New Testament, and we'll get to that. But it is the duty of the priest not only to serve God, but to protect his honor and his dignity and His glory, we do that by living righteously and blamelessly, not perfectly, but by thinking through what we're doing and in our lives is what crowns God with glory and righteousness. I want you to think about that. We sang that song today, crown Him, crown Him, King of glory. Well, how do you do that? You don't crown the king of glory by reading his instructions and saying, eh, that was a long time ago, we've come a long way. That's just not how we do it anymore. No, that's the opposite of crowning him. That's crowning ourselves. Crown us, we've got this all figured out. Better ways than you now, Lord. No, crowning God with righteousness and glory is when we bend at the knee and say, your will be done over us, God. We recognize his wisdom, his holiness, and we call him Lord, and rightly so, because we submit to his instruction as the king of heaven, and we are citizens of heaven. God longs for that in his church, for his people to crown him with honor and glory and dignity again. Because we do the opposite when we live as citizens of earth, but claim to be citizens of heaven. We dishonor our king when we behave that way. God longs for the righteousness and the holiness of his people to return. In fact, the Scriptures, this is not a new problem. Even in the tabernacle, the Scriptures speak of strange fire and useless fire that can be offered to the Lord that is very displeasing to Him. I'm going to talk about strange fire first in Leviticus chapter 10, and I'll move quickly through here. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, this is now speaking of Aaron's two sons ministering in the tabernacle. And they were doing so carelessly with disobedience. Can you imagine? Aaron's still the high priest. How long does it take for this object lesson to lose its impact? Here we have priests ministering in the midst 
I mean, God's holy, God's holy presence behind the veil with smoke and fire rising up is right there, and we have people disregarding him. I can hardly wrap my mind around it. But, but we are no better. We have the same struggles. It says, Now Nabad and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put it and laid it incense on it and offered unauthorized fire, or some translations will say strange fire, before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. Remember, there's specific incense, and there is an altar for this, and there is the Lord's censer for this. Well, they wanted to use their stuff. Fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord, right on the spot. By simply deviating from this plan, God is trying to communicate something here. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said, among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all of the people, I will be glorified. I will not be mocked, is what God was saying. And Aaron's two sons died. And Aaron, it says in verse 3, held his peace. He knew that they were in the wrong. He knew that they were making a mockery of worship. It wasn't just this one incident. Aaron's sons had become very problematic. But they broke the straw on the camel's back when they came. And they didn't use God's censor. And they didn't use God's incense. They just started using their own and burning their own. And God said, finally, I will not have this. They were consumed with fire right inside the tabernacle. Done. Strange fire is religion without reference, reverence. Strange fire is religion without reverence. When we lose sight of God's holiness, we become an irreverent people. We approach Him casually. We disobey Him without giving it much thought. We start to lose the concept that He's an almighty, all-powerful, holy, righteous God, and we are a sinful, wicked people saved by grace. We, We forget that. And we start to abuse the grace that's been given to us. Strange fire is marked by carelessness and disobedience in our worship, and it is a big deal. Those are the symptoms of strange fire. I can promise you, in a group this size, we have people offering strange fire to the Lord. Coming into His presence with disobedience in their lives that they have no plans to fix, to submit to God. Some carelessness. Yeah, time to sing, whatever. Time to pray, go through the motions. We're preaching. What time we getting out of here? I'm getting hungry. We chuckle, but God doesn't. It's a big deal to God. God says, where are the hearts of my people? I had a gentleman at my last church who was always faithful. Around 12 o'clock, I'd get one of these. Always appreciated him. The reverence of God. We are in the presence of God. You know, because this tabernacle isn't just teaching us how to pray, but why? With what spirit we come? Why do you pray? To check the box to say that you got it done? God wants people drawing close to Him because it is a privilege for His people to draw close to Him. They entered the tabernacle gates with joy and thanksgiving. When is the last time in your prayer life you came to God with joy and thanksgiving instead of religious duty? I guess I need to pray. I wouldn't be a very good Christian if I didn't pray. God cares about the heart. We need to take our time and approach Him rightly and allow that fire to burn within us. Not this strange fire. Not this strange fire. It's a big deal to God. There's also a reference to useless fire. It's in Malachi chapter 1. I'll turn there and read from it. Malachi chapter 1, and it's, there's a lot in here, so I'm just going to pick a few of these words here, but listen to the useless fire. In Malachi chapter 1, God says this, Where is my honor, and where is my fear? People were coming into His presence without honor, without fearing God. 
And he says this, he objects, when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, can you imagine that? This, this was supposed to be a sacrifice without blemish, your very best. They were offering blind animals. That's no good to anybody. You just got to put them down. Well, I guess I could use it as a sacrifice and get some value out of it. God says, are you kidding me? You bring me your blind? He says, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? God is angry. Where is my honor, he says. I'm to be honored among the people, among the nations, and you're bringing me your sick animals, your trash? I'm a God to be feared. You ought to be giving me your best. He says in verse 10, Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you may not kindle fire on my altar in vain. What you're doing is useless. I would rather shut down worship, close the tabernacle doors, shut the gates, and put the fires out than let this trashy nonsense continue. God was so upset because people were giving him their garbage. He said in verse 11, My name will be great among the nations. He says it twice. My name will be great among the nations. His people were not crowning him with glory at all. They were insulting him. What would the other nations think when they saw Israel bringing broken, lame, maimed, blind, sick animals to sacrifice to their God? Well, that God must be a pushover. What must people think who look in our day and culture and watch us just go against the will and word and commands of God and do whatever we want? They must think in their minds, that God must be a pushover. You just do whatever you want. It leaves such a sick taste in their mouth. You Christians all say how great your God is, and then look at how you're living. Eh, no thanks, not for me. And God is, is, is up in heaven saying, where is my, where is my honor where is, where is my fear? We as priests are to, to protect the glory of God. Useless fire is religion without repentance. There was no repentance. That great altar that they were bringing these maimed animals to, that was supposed to be the people saying, God, I have sinned. Won't you forgive me? This is the shed blood of my very best without blemish transferring my iniquities onto this innocent animal without blemish, looking forward to the Savior to come. There was no repentance. They were going through the motions, but they were giving God trash. See, it was just a symptom of the reality. The, the, the symptoms, again, the thoughtlessness, apathy, things that we deal with in the church today. What's the real issue going on here? Because poor worship... Useless fire, strange fire is a symptom of a much greater spiritual disease. Church, that disease is indifference. How many of us come to worship God Almighty with a spirit of indifference? And yeah, maybe I'll go today, maybe I won't. Whatever. Maybe I'll sing, maybe I won't. I don't really care. Maybe I'll put something in the plate, maybe not. It doesn't really matter. Maybe I'll listen, or maybe I'll get some work done. Maybe I'll think about some other things. At least I'm here, and I'm going to get out of here soon. A spirit of indifference, when we are here to worship a holy God, is insulting to God. And according to God's own testimony, He'd rather us chain those doors shut and keep the people out than to have indifferent worshipers who don't really care about God. As priests, we are charged with crowning Him with glory, protecting His holiness, but we dishonor Him with our hearts. He said, what a weariness this is. That's what the people were saying. They're bringing, they're bringing their sacrifices, and in verse 13, God hears them. He hears them saying, what a weariness this is. I can't imagine how God thinks through that. 
Here he has gone through this elaborate measure so that he can dwell in the midst of a sinful people. And, and as they're going through the motions now, they're saying, this is such a bother. Wow, what does that communicate to God? What weariness this is. I wonder how many of us came to church this morning with that spirit. What weariness this is. I could be sleeping in. Oh my, God forgive us. This is not how you approach a holy God. You do not come in with a spirit of indifference and tell God, this is, man, this is just so much trouble. He says, shall I accept this from your hand? Do you want me to accept your worship like this? God says, no, I will not accept your worship. He says, I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Now, it just hurts my heart, church. To think that the presence of God could be in here among his people. And he, as he examines the worship coming to him, his response would be, Hey, I'm a great king. What is this? I'm the king of kings and the Lord of lords. What are, what are you bringing to me? How are you approaching me? We can become a weary, we, we can make this whole process weary to God. Israel was wearing God out. See, Jesus came to fix this in God's people. Jesus was part of this solution. I want to talk to you in Luke chapter 3, back to John the Baptist, because he said when Jesus comes, he's going to baptize by the Holy Spirit and with fire, the right kind of fire. Let's talk about baptism by fire. Luke chapter 3, and it, it, we'll put six, verse 16 up on the board here, and just, uh, just as a preface, verse 15 says, as the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John was so filled with the Spirit of God, people looked at him and said, I think we're looking at the Messiah, I think the Christ is here. So they asked him, and John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. Now John knew how to approach the king. They thought he was something really special. And he said, no, I am so not special. I can't, I'm not even worthy to, tie, to, to latch the sandal straps on this man's shoes when he comes. I'm not the Messiah. You wait till he comes. Boy, we need that humility in Christian circles today. We're putting people on pedestals and getting in all kind of trouble with it. We need to stay humble like John, but he understood that Jesus was coming to baptize with the Spirit and with fire. In your worship folders, baptism by fire is religion expressed through the fullness of the Holy Spirit in a fully engaged heart. Someone who has the fire of God burning, authorized fire, the, the passion, has passion in them, has zeal in them. The Spirit is alive in them. There's power in their ministry. There's fruit as a result of their ministry. God's favor is on their lives, and that's a big deal. That's much different than indifference, than apathy, the stuff that drives God nuts. This fire is the spirit unquenched in our hearts. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, Do not quench the spirit. Quench means to extinguish a fire. Don't put that out. When we approach God with indifference, when we live before Him with indifference, we quench the Holy Spirit. We snuff the fire out, the fire that God wants to keep burning at all times. We are called to be priests in the New Testament. Peter calls us a, a holy priesthood. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. And call, uh, the Apostle Paul gets on us, Ephesians 4.1. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have been given. It's the calling to be a priest, a holy people before God. This is all a big deal to God. How we approach a holy God in reverence, or with indifference. I want to close in Hebrews chapter 4. This speaks of Christ now. In verse 14. 
the, the New Testament now teaches that Jesus is our high priest. Remember, the tabernacle is a reality in heaven. This is just a pattern, the things that we're setting up here for you to see now. But there's a reality in heaven. And Jesus now ministers as our high priest. We do not need a priest. We're a kingdom of priests. We can go directly to God for ourselves. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, no one else. Don't approach God through some priest that's been set up or through some pastor that's been set up here. You have just as much access to God as I do or a priest does. You all got a bad habit of talking to me and bringing me your prayer request and say, you've got a connection to the guy upstairs. You pray about this. I've got the same connection you do if you've got the blood of Christ on your heart. All right, there's no difference. Don't come to me to do your work. You can come right into the, the throne of grace. In fact, let's read about it. Read about it. Verse 14. Hebrews 4, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may, have, that we, we, we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Help to do what, church? To lift up the holiness and glory of God as we've been called to do. We are priests. We are protectors of God's holiness and glory as we serve him. This is the attitude that we approach God with. I'm telling you, church, this, is, this whole tabernacle illustration is powerful stuff. It can really help you connect to God like you have never connected to him before. It can weed out our bad and insulting habits and help us to approach the king like he is supposed to be approached. I want to honor him as I come near to him. And I want to be effective in my prayer. We're, we're being given instruction by God himself how to do that. I hope we're listening. Let's refuse to offer any more strange fire, unauthorized fire, useless fire. Let's begin to pray in a manner that honors God and worship Him in a way that changes the way that we speak to Him, the way that we interact. Let's pray, church. Father, I thank You for the illustration at the golden altar. God, a, a place where the, the prayers were to continually Go before the Lord. The incense burned and never went out. The fire never went out. God, as we examine our own hearts right now, some of the things that we talked about today, not giving God our best, approaching you with indifference, even speaking towards worship as though it has become weary to us. God, we, we have all the same struggles as Israel did. But now as we examine this and we see how it made you feel, we see how it was insulting rather than crowning you with glory, our sin is before us here this morning. God, I pray that you would help us to honor you. That you would help us to protect your glory through our obedience and sub submission to your will and commands. I pray that we would be a church that honors you as we come into your presence, that our focus would truly be on you, that our affection and appreciation would truly be set towards you, and that our thoughts would not be distracted with the busyness of life, that we would have hearts that are grateful and not complaining, that we would be forgiving and not bitter, that we would literally walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, that His presence and power would mark our lives, God, that we would be a people set apart, a priesthood that would serve you, God, that others could see your glory. Father, your church needs that Holy Spirit fire again. We have wandered so far away from what your model was. It's time that we... Restore the dignity and the reverence, the honor and the glory, protecting your holiness. God, would you do this work in our hearts? 
Don't let us go another day burning useless fire and strange fire that is a stench before you. But return us, God, to this place where you are pleased by our worship, pleased with our lives, and honored by our behavior. Help us to walk as citizens of heaven who are submitted to heaven's king. Cornerstone, let's just in this moment of quietness allow God to speak to our hearts. After hearing this message this morning, what is God speaking to you? It's not a voice of condemnation because God wants his children to take steps that lead them closer to him. He loves you. He delights in you. He is so glad that you're here. But he wants to help shape your worship to increase the depth of your relationship with him. I hope you hear his voice this morning. I hope you'll follow his lead and his instruction. Church, as you're doing that, there, there may be some here this morning as, as you've listened to this God that we are proclaiming here at Cornerstone Church. I want you to know this holy God is crazy about you. Maybe you don't know what God is really like and you may not walk very closely with God. You're just trying to learn what he's about and what you're supposed to do and you're just seeing if this is even something you want to do. But I want you to know this morning God is crazy about you. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die who had no sin in his life and he is taking, willing to take all of your sin upon himself. He did that at the cross so that in exchange for all your sinfulness, you could receive all his righteousness. That's a profound statement. And in that exchange, you would be made right to come into the presence of a holy God. Outside of that, you would never be granted presence before God. But God has gone through great lengths so that you can come into his presence. But it's only through the blood of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. God wants to forgive you of your sin so that you can come into his presence. It can only be done through Christ. Have you ever asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin? Have you ever called out in faith for Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Maybe God is asking you to do that today. You know, I would pray for you that as God is opening your eyes that this would be a morning of decision. Enough indecision. It's time when the King of Kings calls you by name and invites you into his family and kingdom. Respond. Make it a time of decision. Right now, if you're ready to do so, would you just pray from your heart of hearts? God listens to the heart. God, I receive Christ into my life right now. All the sins of my past I right now place onto him, understanding that he died in my place, enduring the death that I should have endured so that he might live through me. Today, God, I surrender my life to you. I ask you to save my soul, to cleanse me of my sin, and from this day forward, I will live for you. I now belong to you, no longer myself. Make me into the person that you created me to be. And thank you for bringing me into your family. I receive Christ by faith and call him Lord today. With the eyes of the Lord looking through this place, in a moment of privacy just before him, if you just prayed that prayer and you meant it with all your heart, would you just place your hand up in the air for him to see, for me to see? I won't embarrass you, but I want to always acknowledge when people are being drawn to the Lord through repentance. Anyone here this morning, God, I just prayed that prayer. I meant every word of it. Anyone here? No hands that I see going up. So Christians, this message was for us. God is calling his people to deeper, more meaningful, more honoring worship. Let's answer that call. Father, thank you 
for speaking to us this morning. Help us to grow in this area of worship and reverence. In Jesus' name, amen.